<laughs> so, oh. so, so let, let it be recorded that I'm so proud of her. Um, today we're going to, to hear from Dr. Anna valdez Curiel, who after um, finishing her PhD um, on the subject of code atoms is, is, is now a postdoc with us at UCLA. And yes, go for it, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Clarice. And thank Can you, everyone. Can we interrupt you? Can we yes, of course. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, so let me share my screen. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, yes. and we also see a tiny little um, a, 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 a window written build over to the oh. right. No is, build effects. No build effects. Hmm. Huh. That's it's weird. it's fine. It's just in case. Okay. <laughs> it's a feature. It's a feature, not a bug. It's a feature. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Yeah. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for showing up for this. And thank you, Clarice, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, like Clarice said, I worked with cold atoms during my PhD. Not exactly in quantum computing, but something related. And I'll get to tell you a little bit more about that near the end. Uh, but yeah, I would like to convince you today why cold atoms are the coolest qubits, you know, literally and figuratively. Uh, but before, oh, I, okay. Before I get started and tell you how we use cold atoms as qubits, I would like to give you a brief reminder of the things that you have been already uh, learning in some of these um, uh, amazing lectures. So uh, some properties of quantum systems that are uh, very important for implementing qubits um, are the fact that uh, in quantum physics, you don't have this like continuous uh, degrees of freedom. Um, you now have um, discrete, you can have discretized um, things, quantities like energy, for example, and you can use two discrete energy levels um, as a qubit, uh, state zero or state one, representing two energy levels. And what is different uh, between these uh, qubits and the classical bit in a computer is that you can build superpositions of these states. Um, so in a classical computer, the bit is in the zero or one state. In a, a quantum computer, we can build arbitrary superpositions of the zeros and ones. And sometimes people like to represent these superpositions in a block sphere, in this uh, sphere that's called the block sphere. Um, so any combination of zero or one lives in this surface. Um, and finally, the last thing about quantum systems that is important uh, for quantum computing is this uh, property called entanglement. Uh, this is something that happens when you have uh, two or more qubits. Um, and this is saying you that um, whatever happens on say spin or, or uh, your qubit number one uh, will affect what you measure on qubit number two. There, there are um, correlations between the systems. Um, having trouble moving forward. Okay. Um, so yeah, the the world is quantum. You've been learning all about quantum mechanics, but how come when you look around you, the world looks classical? Uh, you don't see fuzzy wave functions and superpositions. And this is because um, there is something called decoherence, uh, which you can think of it as um, the environment doing a measurement on your quantum system before you get to see it. So by the time you look at it, it's no longer quantum. Um, and because of this decoherence, then, uh, the quantum effects, we can only observe them when we look at the systems in particular ways. Uh, so quantum is relevant when we look at really tiny objects or when things are cold, they don't have a lot of thermal energy, they're not moving around. So 
um, it's harder for the environment to accidentally measure. Or if we look very fast before any of these decoherence effects kick in, we can also affect, uh, observe quantum effects. Um, so yeah, I actually had some ideas of um, what other favorite qubits to use besides my cold atoms. Uh, my dog here, he's, uh, he's a good boy and he's also a smart boy. He's, he's in a superposition state, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I also thought we could do entangled states with dog and cat beats, but um, it turns out that unfortunately, um, as cute as they are, uh, these uh, eigen pets, they're, they're too hot and too big to be uh, quantum objects. So we're gonna have to uh, skip, um, stick to using uh, tinier objects as qubits. I don't know if you heard the dog bark in the background, by the way. I think he knows I'm talking about him. Um, yeah, so um, just another quick reminder about what are the requirements that we need to build a quantum computer. These are also um, known as the DiVincenzo criteria. And what these are like a set of rules that any system needs to um, comply with so that we can make uh, quantum computers out of them. So first we need to have uh, well-defined quantum states. This is like something all quantum systems have, I guess. We need to be able to uh, initialize the state. So prepare your qubit in zero or one, however you want. Uh, you also need to be able to read out the state of the qubit. So after you do your operations and whatnot, you need to know what was the state in the end, zero, one, or some superposition. Uh, you also need to be able to do some uh, universal set of gates. Uh, these are the minimum gates you can uh, you need such that uh, you can then do arbitrary operations with a qubit. Um, then you need to have long coherence time. This means uh, the system will remain in a quantum state for a really long time so that you can perform as many operations um, with your qubits before they go away and die. And finally, you need to be able to scale up your system because uh, classical computers as they are today, they're very powerful. They have lots of classical bits. So um, we, we need a decent number of qubits enabled to, in order to outperform um, <coughs> the classical computers. And now um, for the rest of the talk, I will try to convince you why cold atoms are a great platform to make qubits. But here are a few points to get started. Um, atoms are good because they're all identical. Um, so you have learned about some other qubits already. For example, the um, quantum dots and, uh, in spins in quantum dots and these kind of solid state, devi solid state devices. Um, they are like microfabricated. They're done by a person and there's, or a machine and there's, there's tendency to uh, have some variability. So um, the, the atoms nature gave us all of them the same. So we don't need to be worrying about tweaking one atom or the other. Uh, if we stick to one element, then they're all the same and it's good. Um, also, there are many atoms available, so hey, it's easy to scale up. Um, and uh, there has been lots of research going on in the field of atoms uh, and atomic physics. Uh, and we have developed techniques that allow us to control them really well and isolate them really well from the environment, um, which is going to be very helpful to implement these um, uh, individual control and all the DiVincenzo criteria that I mentioned before. Um, so atoms have been around um, us 
well, the study of atoms has played a very important role in our understanding of quantum physics for the past hundred years or more. Uh, and, uh, you know, back in 1913, uh, a guy named Niels Bohr came up with this model for atoms where he, he proposed that um, electrons can only live in very specific orbits uh, that are quantized in energy and that in order for the electron to jump from one orbit to the other, it needs to absorb some light or emit some light at a very um, specific color. And he came up with this model to try to describe what uh, people were observing when they looked at the spectrum of the light that um, certain elements emitted. Um, yeah, so atoms have been really informing our understanding of quantum physics and have been used as a test bed for doing all sorts of experiments that help us uh, confirm and understand some new theories. And to this day, the level of control that physicists have achieved with atoms is really incredible. So uh, today, uh, physicists can, you know, grab onto an individual, like a single atom, and uh, array, make a race of them and individually control the state of a single atom within um, some artificially made array. So that's, that's really impressive. Uh, I don't know, when you stop to think of, about it, to me, this is mind blowing. Um, and atoms actually, even though there's been all this research going on for more than a century, Atoms were not really thought of as qubits uh, or as, yeah, as good qubits until maybe the last 10 years or so. Um, but it is all this uh, research and development that happened uh, before uh, people were trying to do better atomic clocks, started trying to do better spectroscopy measurements uh, with atoms. And this led to the development of lots of technology that now that we have it, it's like, yes, this is perfect for, um, this is what we need to make a good quantum computer. Uh, so they have become, atoms have become a lot more popular platform for quantum computing uh, lately. Um, so when I mentioned that we do, um, that we use atoms as qubits, uh, I want to clarify that. I don't mean like we have a chunk of some material and we use the, the atoms in that chunk of material. These atoms are actually in a gas phase. And this is because um, in a material, the atoms are um, very, very closely packed together. So if I wanted to individually address atoms in individual atoms in a material, it could be a little more complicated. Um, so all these uh, cold atom qubit platforms actually use atoms in the gas phase. Uh, but if you were to look at some, I don't know, nitrogen uh, atoms in the air, um, what you would see is that um, because they're at room temperature, they're all moving around, they're crashing with each other. Um, and maybe there will be like a carbon atom or something else that come kicks your nitrogen atom. So uh, if we want to make a reliable qubit, you don't want to prepare your like one state and then have another atom come crashing it and destroy it. So it's important that, that in these atomic systems, we make them in an isolated environment and at really cold temperatures so that they're not um, moving around like crazy. Um, so to deal with these um, isolation um, issues, we put the atoms in vacuum chambers. And this is very similar to what they do in the cold, uh, in the ion ex trapped ion experiments that you heard two weeks ago. Um, so we, we build these, uh, I mean, 
chunky metal chambers and we pump as much air out of them as we can. Um, so if you look at um, a gas at room temperature, it might take two atoms. Um, the atoms will take, uh, will need to travel only like 10 to the minus eight meters, uh, 10 nanometers before they see another atom and crash. In the in these like super high, uh, super low pressure environments that we have in these chambers, it would take an atom many meters before it sees another atom and crashes with them. Um, so the the pressures in these chambers are actually like <coughs> ten ten orders of magnitude um, ish. Um, lower than atmospheric pressure. So this this really means that the atoms will be really, really well isolated and the, prob the probability that some impurity atom comes and crashes and destroys mercury is going to be really low. So the coherence time in cold atom qubits can be really, really long. Um, now, cooling is another issue I said that is important to address. And I just want to give you an idea of how cool things are when I say they're cool. Um, so on this, um, on this axis here, I'm showing temperatures in Kelvin degrees. And uh, actually in this temperature scale, like uh, people were mentioning at the start of the talk, the, the lowest absolute temperature you can have is zero Kelvin. Um, and the room temperature is more or less somewhere here at 300 Kelvin, roughly. And in this scale, um, the temperature where water freezes is at 270 Kelvin. It's just like ever so slightly closer to room temperature in this scale. If you keep going down on the temperature scale, you will encounter um, the temperature of outer space. Uh, this is the cosmic microwave, microwave background at only 10 to the one Kelvin. So this is the temperature of the universe. This is as cold as it can get in the universe. Um, but we have figured out ways to go colder than the coldest place in the universe. Um, so actually superconducting qubits that are placed inside dilution refrigerators. They are at millikelvin temperatures. And with cold atoms, we go even colder than that. Um, most of the qubit experiments are done with atoms at microkelvin temperature, like 10 to the minus six. And there is this uh, really cool um, kind of phase of matter that you can study at even lowest temperature that is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. And I, I used to work with these guys, um, super cool. And yeah, these guys are at nano Kelvin. This is absolutely the coldest place in the universe. And if we go up on this scale, um, the temperature of a nuclear explosion is at 10 to the six Kelvin. And the inside of hot stars is at 10 to the nine Kelvin. So it's kind of mind blowing to think that you, you here uh, watching this talk are closer in temperature to the inside of a burning hot star than you are from the temperature of a cold atom. So it is really, really, really cold. Um, so how do we even achieve this? super cold temperatures. Um, again, I want to remind you that when, when I say cold here, I mean um, that, be, that uh, my atoms are not moving too much. Um, they, their velocity is very close to zero. Um, so you can think of atoms as uh, maybe a moving train, a heavy moving train that is coming towards you. And of course, if you think what is the best way to slow down this train, you're going to say, I'm going to grab some ping pong balls and the cat to shoot 
um, balls at the train, and that's going to stop it, right? This is the best way to stop the train. Uh, and as crazy as this may sound, this is actually kind of the principle that we use to um, cool atoms down to such low temperatures. Uh, and the idea is we use, uh, we shine a beam of laser light into the atoms that will give them tiny kicks that will slow them down. Um, and I know it sounds kind of crazy to think that lasers can um, slow things down or make them colder. Because if you think about it, like laser is like putting energy on your system, it should be making it hotter. Um, but let me walk you through the steps of how this works and hopefully uh, you can be convinced that it works. So imagine that you have an atom moving to the right and a, a photon moving to the left. Um, so the atom sees this photon and if its energy is right, if its color is right, it will absorb the photon. And when it absorbs the photon, it will get a tiny kick. So that means the atom will be slowed down a bit. Um, and after some time, the atom will emit this photon again. This always happens. Um, and it will emit this photon in kind of a random direction. So it will also get a kick and it might uh, change this already, its direction a bit. But after emitting, uh, after repeating this, pro this process many times, kind of this direction, the, the kick from the emitted photon in, is average in all these directions. And you just get um, your velocity slowed. You, you, you're slow down in the direction of the light. Uh, so one beam would be enough to, uh, to slow down um, atoms moving in one direction. If we want to slow atoms all across space, we need to add more uh, laser beams. And this is what is used in a uh, magneto optical trap. The, and these, uh, these traps use a combination of uh, coils that produce magnetic fields, and then six lasers kind of in all spatial directions. Um, and with this configuration, say I, I have my atom here and it starts moving to the right, uh, it will see the laser here, uh, but it will not see these other lasers so much. Um, and then it will get a kick preferably from this laser back to the center. And then if it keeps wandering and it wants to go down, it will get a kick from the laser uh, down here and push it up. Um, so these, these magneto-optical traps are used to confining and providing uh, more cooling to the atoms. And here on the right, I'm showing you a picture of how um, a mod uh, or the mod that we used to have in my lab in my PhD. And yeah, there is this glass cell um, that is held under super high vacuum. And then you see these uh, orange things here. These are coils that produce magnetic fields. And Anna, Anna, th there's a mm -hmm. question. I, I wonder if the person who posted the question on the chat, if they would like to. Sure. Hi. Uh, so my question is, what is the intensity of the light that uh, the atoms are shined with? Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. So we use, I guess it was like maybe a few, uh, hundreds of microwatts and the beams are like yay big um you you do need like a fair amount of light to make this work. thank you very much and the other question so what is uh, should we use a specific wavelength of the light or any like should we yes. consider any range okay so what is the range of wavelength then 
sorry, no, it's it's more like a specific uh, wavelength, and this has to do mm -hmm. with the uh, the atomic transition. So the the wavelength that the atom naturally absorbs. I see. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, could I maybe ask a question? Sure. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, this is kind of a more general question, but I thought about it just now because you were talking about uh, cooling atoms down. Is like is is light somehow like harder to like more coherent in general? Because it feels like you know you can do like a double slit experiment and stuff and kind of see evidence of quantum behavior at like uh, at a human scale, right? Like you can perform a double slit experiment and people are able to see it. So like, why is light able to exhibit quantum behavior at a room temperature and at a human scale when other things aren't able to? I don't know. Yeah. No, this is, this is a good question. Um, I'm thinking about some of the things that Donnie said last week, um, where, um, so I guess, for each color of light, you can associate like a temperature to it. So actually, the, like the color of visible light corresponds to um, Wait, it corresponds to warm temperatures. Um, Does light even really like, do photons, can you even really say they like have a temperature? Is that like even a thing? No, it's more like uh, objects at a certain temperature will radiate photons. Like um, if you're warm, you will, um, you will emit photons at um more higher energy the, like the the warmer you are the higher the energy that the photons that you radiate will have if that makes any sense oh. and, um, may i so may i suggest something because like you, you don't need the laser for the bose lit experiment with light to work but you need the laser for For laser cooling, right? Can can you maybe tell us why a laser is different from from like light of your lamp or something? Yeah, I guess the laser, um, the lamp will have like photons in some distribution of uh, of colors, and the laser light is just like all photons, kind of in sync, in phase. Um, uh, yeah. So back to your question, I guess the this double slit interference, this is this is something you would observe with like it's like a wave property, right? Uh, and some quantum objects have this wave nature, but just the fact that you observe interference in waves doesn't make something quantum. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let me carry on. So I just wanted to show a picture here. I don't have an actual picture of atoms in the in the magneto optical trap, but if you were look at, if you were to look at it, you'll see like uh, maybe half a centimeter little blob glowing in the same color uh, with the same color as your lasers. Uh, but I have a picture of the cold atoms in this screen, and yeah, this like little glowing guy is uh, something close to like a billion atoms at micro Kelvin temperatures. Um, so great, we managed to uh, isolate our atoms from the environment and cool them down. Then uh, the next challenge is to be able to trap individual 
an individual atom so that we can then address it with some lasers and um, do some qubit operations. Um, the problem with atoms is that they are neutral, they don't have charge. So when you learned about um, the trapped ion experiments, ions have charge, so you can use um, electric fields to confine them. We cannot do this with atoms, but luckily uh, lasers again come to the rescue. So uh, you might have seen this kind of experiment with a pencil in a glass of water and how uh, the beams of light are bent in different ways in air and water and therefore you see this weird shape. Uh, so this is something, there is something similar happening um, when you shine some light through a lens. Um, the lens will bend the beams of light depending on the thickness of the material and the angle of that the light makes, makes with the lens. And when it bends the beams, um, it actually, well, there's, there's some change in momentum, in the momentum of the light. So that must mean there is a force um, pushing the lens up. And yeah, the lens is very big and uh, it will probably not move at all. Uh, but the message here is that light can actually impart forces in objects when it uh, diffracts. Uh, so now if instead of looking at what is happening on the lens, we look at what is happening uh, on an atom. So for now, let's pretend that the atom is not a quantum object. Let's just think of the atom as a little bead of glass. Um, when there is, when it sees some light, it might bend the light uh, and change its direction. So that will cause the atom to feel a force. Uh, here it would feel a force going down. If the atom is at the center, it will not bend the light, so there will be no force. And um, if I move to the other side, then it will feel a force going up. So the message here is that atoms will tend to go where the light is being focused, where the light is most intense. So last week, we learned that it's impossible to make lightsabers. So I have some good news for the Star Trek fans out there. We can actually build uh, tractor beams, uh, tiny tractor beams for atoms using light. Um, so you can think of a focusing beam of light as like a little cup that will hold the atoms. Um, and these actually, uh, these are called optical tweezers and they have been very useful, not only in physics, but also biologists have been using them for many decades now and they can use these to uh, grab little cells or molecules and move them around. Uh, it's some really powerful technology. Um, another important thing about this uh, effect of uh, light forces is that the color is important. Um, so if, if I were to use uh, light that is matching the color that uh, the atoms uh, will absorb, then I get no force. The atom just absorbs the light. But if I change the color a little, if I make it, uh, if I use light with less energy, so like a redder color, um, the atom will most likely not absorb the light, but instead bend it. And this is when you will, in, in one way, and you'll get an attractive force. And if you use light with more energy, more on the blue side, of the spectrum, the, the beams will bend in the opposite way and they will feel a repulsive force. Um, so yeah, I just want to mention that color is important in this effect too. And this is all combined to, um, to trap individual atoms in different ways. One thing you can do is you can use a combination of lasers to create like standing waves and the atoms will be, can be trapped in the nodes, uh, not sorry, not the nodes, the, the minimum points on your, on your wave. And you can use a combination of lasers to create this kind of like egg shell uh, potentials. And here's some pictures of a group at Penn State University that trapped atoms in uh, 
many planes. And they, then they showed how they could individually control um, different atoms within these planes and write the words PSU in the atoms. Um, another way people have been using this technology to trap atoms is um, using uh, kind of the more, the, using tweezers. So instead of using like a standing wave, you can split one beam of light into many beams and then focus them. Um, like this here, this, the, the laser is split into many tiny tweezers. And this, this is really powerful because it's very, uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It's very uh, highly configurable. And people have some have done some really uh, cool things. Like a group in France actually did an Eiffel Tower out of atoms or a Mobius strip. So this this technology has been super powerful for controlling atoms. Um, so. Now I want to tell you how, once we are able to like trap and control it, each atom, I wanna tell you how we turn them into qubits. So you have all these elements on the periodic table, right? Um, so people mostly look at the alkalis on the leftmost column to use qubit, to make qubits because they are the closest to hydrogen atom and they're the simplest, really. And actually, hydrogen is tricky because um, there's not there's not very good lasers to work with hydrogen. So even though it's the simplest, we don't make qubits out of hydrogen. Um, and francium is really active. Um, and I told you a bit earlier about this model for uh, the Bohr atom, where electrons can move in in specific orbits. And when they jump from one orbit to the other, they absorb or emit a photon. So you can kind of imagine, oh, well, let's make a qubit out of these two states in the atom. And well, in reality, atoms are a bit more complicated than that. They have uh, different like quantum degrees of freedom. They have angular momentum, so how the electron moves in the orbit. There is spin in the electron, um, tiny magnet pointing up or down, there is spin in the nucleus. So when you, and, and this all, these degrees of freedom all interact with each other. So when you kind of put it all together, um, you get something that looks messy and scary at first, maybe. Uh, this is the, some of the energy um, levels of rubidium 87, the atom that I work with. Uh, but you don't need to uh, focus too much on this. Um, in order to make a qubit, you just need to select three levels, uh, three quantized levels out of that zoo of atomic levels. Uh, you first take a ground state, that will be the state zero of your qubit. Um, then you choose another state that uh, preferably lives for a really long time so that when you prepare the state one, you don't want it to decay back into zero. And these two states will form your qubit phases where you will be doing operations and rotations and stuff. And then uh, you can select another level that is higher up in energy uh, that will be uh, used for reading out the state of the qubit. So this state uh, is higher in energy and typically absorbs, well, for rubidium, it's uh, infrared photons. For some other atoms, it's visible light. Uh, but usually after it, you can excite the atom to this level and it will very fastly decay uh, after roughly 100 nanoseconds or so and emit some light in the process. So then if I prepare my qubit in state zero and I shine some light, uh, I will not excite the atom, so I will not measure any light. So 
I will know that the atom was in state zero if I measure no light. Um, then if I am in the state one and I shine some light, the atom will get excited and then it will emit some light. So um, I will know that I was in state one. So this is what we do to um, know what the state of the qubit was based on the light that it emits. Um, another important ingredient now is how do we do um, gates with these qubits? How do we do rotations? So again, uh, it's all light. Um, so if I look at my qubit in uh, state zero, or suppose my qubit starts in state zero and I shine some light whose color matches the energy of this transition. Um, if I flash the light on for a really short time, it's very likely that the atom will not get a chance to absorb the photon. Uh, but if I turn it on for a slightly longer time, maybe half of the time it will absorb and half of the time it will not absorb. Uh, so this is how we do a superposition. And if I leave it on for even a little longer, uh, I will, with a very high probability, maybe 99.999 something percent, uh, I will be able to excite my qubit into state one. Um, so this is the principle behind most of the single qubit gates, where by shining light for a specific um, time, I can control whether I'm in state zero, one, or some arbitrary superposition. Um, and just to wrap up, um, I guess another important ingredient for quantum computing and building universal gates is this is being able to do gates with two qubits. And with uh, atoms, well, in order to do two qubit gates, you need to be able to generate some entanglement. Oh, well, this is necessary to generate some entanglement. And typically, well, not typical, you, you need interactions to in order to do these two qubit operations. And atoms, um, you know, they're tiny in these uh, arrays and that I showed you before, they're very far apart. So you can think of them um, as like tiny billiard balls, they kind of don't really see each other and they're neutral, they don't have charge, they, they don't usually have any magnetic uh, moment. So it's a little tricky to make them interact with each other. Um, but one of the most promising ways to, to make strong interactions with atoms is using something that's called Rydberg. Some people call it soup, call them super atoms. And the idea behind these atoms is that, um, you know, for a typical atom in the ground state, the electron will be very close to the nuclei and um, the atom is tiny. It's like one angstrom or 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, in these Rydberg super atoms, the electron has been excited to a really, really, really high energy state. Um, so it's it's huge. Um, and because these uh, charges are now, the separation of these charges is now really large, they can be used, they, they have like, they have strong electric interactions. So now these Rydberg atoms can be used to generate um, entanglement and things like that. And I just wanted to give you a sense of how big these Rydberg atoms are. And this picture is really not to scale because otherwise it wouldn't fit my screen. But uh, some of these atoms in the Rydberg state are actually <laughs> larger than the coronavirus. So yeah, hopefully I convince you that uh, cold atoms are indeed cool. And I showed you how we can isolate them from the environment and cool them down with lasers. I also show them how we control and make arrays of individual atoms using light. Um, I also showed you how 
we can use three levels to um, breathe out the quantum state. And I showed you how we make gates with them. Um, yeah, just one last thing is that because atoms are a promising platform for quantum information, there's a few companies out there that have that are trying to build commercial quantum computers with atoms. And I think these are all the ones that currently exist. Um, atom computing is there in Berkeley. These guys are in Boston. Uh, these guys are in Boulder, Colorado, and these guys uh, are in France. And yeah, thank you. And I will like to tell you a bit about my career path uh, in the remaining time, but if there is questions before, I'm happy to take them. Well, I will tell you a little bit about my career path then, uh, which starts in Mexico City and makes a stop in Maryland and now takes me to uh, UCLA. So yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Mexico City. Um, and I guess I, I kind of always liked the idea of, being a scientist, that sounded like a cool thing. At some point, I wanted to be a biologist, but then I thought maybe it's better to be a physicist because I don't need to memorize things and physics is easy. Um, and I guess I was a little uh, mistaken there, but you know. Uh, so I, I went to a public university in Mexico City it's called UNAM. And uh, Yeah, I guess, um, honestly, well, in Mexico, when you go to university, you need to have chosen your major already. So I said, yes, I'm going to study physics. And uh, when I started taking my physics classes, I encountered that everything was harder <laughs> than I imagined could be possible. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a shock. Um, but I guess finding a right group of people to work with, um, and with some patience, uh, I was able to pull it through. Um, one thing though, that I wish I had done differently was that, um, I was mostly focusing on my classes. Um, I didn't. It didn't occur to me that I could be doing some research as an undergraduate. And I think that would have been a really valuable experience for me. And looking back, I really wish I had my hands on some research earlier on. Um, but luckily at the last year of my undergraduate, there was this, um, opportunity to do a, a summer of research at the University of Maryland. Um, they selected two Mexican undergraduates to go there. So it was me and another Mexican woman. And yeah, it was kind of a game changer for me. Um, it, it's not so easy to be exposed to these psych high-tech experiments in Mexico because it takes a lot of money to build them. So just coming into the lab and seeing these like massive experiments, I was like, oh my goodness, how, what does this all do? Like it was kind of crazy and mind blowing. Uh, but yeah, I was working in um, an experiment that, I mean, an experiment that, um, uh, did research on quantum optics, so like the quantum nature of light. So I I started kind of liking this idea behind um, 
these tabletop experiments where like quantum physics is like really in your face. It's like you learn all these things on your textbook, but just like being able to see it there in the experiment, that to me was really amazing. And I decided to uh, push for a PhD also at the University of Maryland. Um, where I um, studied something slightly different. I was looking at these Bose-Einstein Bose condensates that are uh, these blobs of super cool atoms. Um, and uh, this is like an extremely, you can think of this Bose-Einstein condensate as a many atoms all in the same quantum state behaving as a super atom it's like it was i don't know it was mind-blowing um and it was very nice working at um the university of maryland because there is this um joint quantum institute which is a collaboration between the national institute of standards and technology and the university so we got to the opportunity to work with um, so many great um, researchers and uh, so many great students. And uh, yeah, again, I was kind of mind blown by how we could have quantum physics like in your face. This is kind of a typical textbook example of the stern gerlach experiment that was used to prove that um, particles have spin, uh, where um, a magnet separates the different spins into different positions. And I got to see that with the atoms, you know. So it, it was really cool. Um, and in my research, I did something that is called quantum simulation. The idea is kind of like you're trying to build an analog quantum computer. So instead of using zeros and ones, uh, you're um, trying to fool the atoms to behave like there's something else. And some of the things I got to look at is trying to pretend the, uh, the atoms were charged electrons in a magnetic field and try to reproduce this um, fractal energy. Um, I also got to pretend that atoms were electrons in two-dimensional materials and uh, got to see this. Uh, this, uh, this is a picture of atoms just doing some really groovy things. And uh, something I really like about being an experimentalist, atomic, uh, experimental atomic physicist is that you get to work with so many different things. Um, there's lasers, of course, but sometimes you're dealing with building electric circuits. Sometimes you're uh, programming things in the computer. Some other days you're plumbing. Of course, in as, as every graduate student or student in, in any discipline, there's all the coffee drinking and food hunting. And I would be, I, I would not be honest with you if I told you, oh, it's great every day. It's so inspiring. It's awesome. There is also a lot of banging your head against the wall and crying. <laughs> um, personally, for me, there is there is something called imposter syndrome that I have to deal with, um, where there is a tiny voice in your head telling you, you're not good enough. Um, you got here by luck. It's a mistake. But you have to learn to identify that that's the voice of the imposter in your head. So if, if you ever hear these little voices in your head, uh, you should know that that's the imposter and not the truth. Um, yeah, and uh, so fast forward, I finished my PhD and I was wondering what's next. Oh, well, sorry, I forgot to tell you that um, Another aspect that I really got to love and enjoy about my work is that I got to meet really amazing people. Um, and I think it's it's not just important that you find 
something to do that you like, it's also important that you find people that you like to do the things with. Um, and I think I was very lucky to meet all these amazing people throughout my career. And besides doing science, we got to have fun together. Um, this is my advisor here from grad school, Ian, um, being reckless. <laughs> and uh, I also got to meet Bill Phillips, who actually got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of laser cooling back in 1997. Um, so that was super cool. And uh, from all the people that came before me in grad school, I can give you an idea of the diverse careers they all have had. Um, like uh, Dina here, now she's a part-time science podcaster, part-time um, quantum computing. She, she works part-time at a quantum computing startup. Um, Lauren, she wants to do science policy. Uh, ben here, he's building atomic clocks for a company. And Dika, he's a science, um, he's a technical writer for MathWorks. Um, Ivy is a research scientist at um, Georgia Tech Research Institute. Um, Dan here is also a research scientist at Northrop Grumman. So yeah, Seiji went on to become a professor. So actually, probably a very small fraction of the people that I have interacted with have continued to become professors, but they have all found paths that I think are very diverse and they are happy with. Um, so yeah, finally, I, I finished my PhD and I was looking for what next. Um, I was a little torn between continuing with academia and doing a postdoc or doing something more like in the industry. I actually was applying for some jobs in quantum computing startups and also for postdocs. And in the end, I guess I was convinced by Clarice to um, come study uh, quantum phenomena in a very different context. I told you about how I studied cold atoms in super clean environments. Now, um, the question is, are there uh, quantum effects that are relevant happening in hot, dirty environments, such as you know living things? Um, I think for me, making the decision to continue with this um, postdoc instead of taking any other job. I think, again, the, the people have a very uh, important role. I, I think for me, it's just really important that I find a group of people that I feel uh, happy and comfortable with. And um, also something that I find that is interesting. So I think this job tick both boxes. So here I am. And uh, because we're running a bit late now, I'll stop here and take more questions. Can we clap? Can we sure. unmute yourselves and, and clap on that? Questions to Anna. She spoke a lot about a, a lot about a lot of things, about her career, the cold atoms, the super cool cold atoms. Questions. Um, I have a question about how to control the qubits. Mm -hmm. um, so, when you want to put the qubit into the excited states, like one state one. Mm -hmm. Do you try another laser light besides the optical tweezer lights? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, if you want to control the several qubits together, then do you need to shine the light in different directions? Yeah, let me go back a little. Um, yeah, so like people take a few different approaches. Like here, they use like two lasers and where the lasers intersect, um, that will be the qubit that they are controlling. Um, on some of the um, other twister experiments, they usually just have like one plane and one plane of atoms. They, they don't usually do quantum computers with the Eiffel Tower. I'm sorry, it's just really cool. <laughs> um good picture yeah so uh ima the, imagine you have your laser that um creates a trap you can then add another laser that is has like the same geometry but just a different color and you can then use like individual lasers on the on each um atom to control them just nice. different colors same geometry Thank you. Yeah, boy. Oh, that was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Has is it has any materials or whatnot been made with like the super big atoms? Sorry, what? Can you has, repeat the question? Has anyone made materials out of the super big atoms? Um sort of. <laughs> We make uh, artificial materials, let's call them. They they would not live outside of your vacuum chamber, but oh, well, um, yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. What kind of properties does it have? What is like the stuff you make out of giant atoms? What kind of materials I make with giant atoms? Yeah. Um, well, it can be a variety of things. Some people do um, kind of more boring material, but the idea is that here you can have like a perfect crystal, like on, on the normal materials that you see, like this guy or whatever. Yeah. There's defects and stuff. So in, in these kind of artificial materials, you can have like, everything be perfect. Um, some really cool experiment, one of my favorite experiments that people have done with these uh, super atoms is they like put them on a ring shaped trap and they blow it up. Um, and they have used this to simulate the expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. Wow, that's cool, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. The lab next to mine was working on that in graduate school. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, let's just start a new universe in our vacuum chamber. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Hi, Anna. Thank you for, for this uh, nice presentation. I would like to ask you about the, the coherence time of the coal atoms. How long is is this in this kind of system? And also, uh, the gates that you apply uh, for one and two qubits, um, like the error of those gates, is of what order? I see. Um, coherence times can be at least seconds. Um, depends on 
how good of a job you do with your vacuum and all that, but seconds, which which is really, really good. Like um, some of the superconducting qubits, they have, you know, they're fighting to get microsecond coherence times. And uh, in terms of how good the gates are, um, they're good, I would say. Um, people like to use this number called fidelity, which is like comparing what you actually make compared to what you hoped you would make. Um, so like 100% fidelity means you, um, you exactly created the state you wanted to create. Uh, and I think gate fidelities are like on the 99.9 something percent. Trapped ions are, uh, gates are at this point better, um, but also trapped ions have been doing this for a really long time and we're trying to catch up. <laughs> Thank you. Dog wants to say hi. And uh, now, when you have the atoms inside the vacuum chamber in the trap, and and they there are collisions and they go away, where, where do they end up? Um. Yeah. So usually these vacuum chambers. They have these um, like um, pumps um, that produce, um, they're called ion pumps. They produce like a really strong magnetic uh, electric field. So if, uh, if an atom manages to fly near it, it will like ionize it and suck them out. But sometimes they will just stick to the wall of the chamber and never be seen again. Rubidium is very sticky. Anna? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Oh. How do you create those atoms in the gas phase? So you have a material and what do you do with the material so that? Oh, um, yeah. So we usually start with, we have like a chunk of metal in the inside the vacuum chamber and it's in the solid phase. It's, it, I had some pictures, but I lost it. Yeah, it, it, there's like a piece of metal inside and we heat it up um, so it um, becomes a vapor. And once it's like a, the vapor, we start shooting the lasers to start cooling down the vapor. So heating before cooling down. Sorry, I have one, one more one more request. Anna, tell us about the refrigerator example. Oh, yeah. Uh, this has to do with laser cooling. Um, the, quest, the question is, how come you can cool things down with light if you're putting in energy right from the laser um and that sounds kind of impossible but also now if you think about the refrigerator in your kitchen you're actually it is also plugged to the electrical outlet right so you're still putting energy into your into into your refrigerator but it's um somehow cooling uh, down still. So the idea is that um, it's not so much the energy that you put in, but it's more how you distribute the energy. So this is why laser cooling works and this is why your refrigerator works. I have a question in relation to like the vaccine that everyone's been talking about and how like, I'm pretty sure like you see all over the news, like they're saying like they need to put the vaccine in like super chilly freezers. Like how does this like apply to like what we were talking about today? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, 
unfortunately, um, let me get the dog. Unfortunately, ah, uh, this, I mean, this is super cold, but th that's only like a few thousands uh, or tens of thousands of atoms living inside a vacuum chamber. If I were to take, this is so, so cold, but like the moment I put that in contact with a massive object, like it's gonna be warm again. So, um, I guess these techniques are very powerful to cool down like a few atoms, but as far as I know, no one has tried to laser cool like a super massive thing. Maybe once we have better lasers. <laughs> I don't know. You could try it. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I wish we could be doing more things with the atoms to help with deal with the coronavirus. Well, uh -huh. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and uh, asking all your questions. This has been fun. And, and don't forget that Anna is at UCLA. She's she's going to be your neighbor soon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you have more questions or want to talk or whatever, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Anna, there's actually one last question, I think. Oh. And what in the chat, what's your strategy to scale up the code atom quantum computer type? Um, well, I guess like the, the clouds I show you this, like the picture of these moths. <laughs> Uh, the picture of good job. Go to your hobby, please. Sorry. Um, yeah, I guess it's easy to have many atoms, but it's not so easy to have individual control over many atoms. Um, so these these Twitter arrays, for example, um, I think the biggest limitation there is. Uh, you need a lot of optical power to produce many uh, tweezers. So I guess you could try getting more powerful lasers to try to build bigger arrays, or you could try to do something like build smaller arrays in separate chambers and connect them uh, to each other with photons. I think either of these two approaches. Oops. Okay, they, they thank you in the chat. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about the other qubits to come. I hope and actually le next week it's me. Oh yes. Next week we're going to talk about messy, messy quantum systems at room temperature. We're going to talk about spins in diamond. They're not so cold, but they're also. <coughs> so Anna, it was very, very cool. Thanks for that. You're awesome. And see you, see everyone else in a week. Anna, do Thank you, want you to everyone. Close this? Have a nice there's a, a, a chat in the, in the uh, there, there's a comment in the chat saying they love your dog. <laughs> trying to get here to come say hi.
you still a spark. <laughs> All right. See you next week, everyone. Bye. Say bye, everyone. Bye. It was very cool. Very, 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 very nice. Cool. See you soon. Bye.